Welcome to Principles for Principles. My name is Dr. Jonathan Bernkrant. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, as well as an adult psychiatrist. I'm also a pediatrician. And interestingly, I used to be a school teacher. In any event, this talk is on cannabis facts. What's the science and the significance behind it? I do want to note that I'm not getting any remuneration for this, and I never take any money for these uh, presentations. So let's start off with some good news. The good news is that eighth grade cigarette smoking has dropped 50% in the past five years. Eighth grade alcohol use has dropped 15 to 90% in the past five years. So that's the good news. Here's the not so good news. The not so good news is that high school seniors don't feel like marijuana is harmful. Only 16% of 12th graders think occasional marijuana use puts them at great risk. And eighth grade marijuana use really has remained steady. If we were to ask a student whether or not they think their peers are using drugs, whether it be alcohol or marijuana or other drugs, 75% of them would say, yes, my peers are using these drugs. Well, if we do a real study and we find out what are the actual numbers, the reality is only 25% of high school students are actually using drugs such as marijuana and such. And this really speaks to a child's understanding of peer pressure and the peer pressure they're under to use. The marijuana of today is not yesterday's marijuana. The THC concentrations in the 70s were around two to 6%. Nowadays, the THC concentration, the psychoactive component of marijuana, that concentration is 18 to 26% and sometimes more. In fact, there's this stuff now called shatter. That's what this is. And that could be 80% or more THC concentration. That's a huge number and again, very dangerous. There's also a lot of varieties and with these varieties come a lot of false claims, such as, oh, this is good for such and such. This is good for anxiety. This is good for sleep. They're really unfounded, and there's no, no evidence to support that, no real evidence at least. The other scary thing for all of us uh, is especially edibles. Edibles are extremely difficult to identify. They can look like any uh, other type of food lollipops, sodas, candies. 40% of 12th graders use edibles if they're using marijuana. In terms of our students, marijuana really affects their IQ. It can lower their IQ by eight points actually. And the earlier they start, the more it can lower the IQ. So how does that affect school? Well, in fact, lower grades as you'd expect as well as more likely to delay graduation and drop out of school, possibly not even earn a degree. So let's get into some of the facts in terms of the science. So this is your brain. This brain is made up of about 75% fat. That's important because THC, again, the psychoactive component of marijuana, has a predilection to go towards fat and fat cells. And that's where it gets stored. The brain of an adult is only about 2% in terms of its weight compared to the rest of the body. But of that 20% of all the blood to 25% goes to the brain. So every time your, your, your heart beats, it's going to send 20 to 25% of whatever's in the blood up to the brain, including drugs. This is a brain cell. It's called a neuron. That's what makes up the brain. How many neurons are there in our brain? Well, there's 100 billion neurons. That's the same number of stars that are in the galaxy. And all of those neurons connect with one another. Those connections are where we are able to think, where we're able to function as human beings. 100 billion neurons make 10 trillion connections. That's a lot of connections, and that's why we can effectively think at such a high level. However, brain cell death is permanent. Now, some brain cell death is needed. That's called pruning. 
Pruning is something that we do to learn. So children, as they grow, prune to get learning. Some neural cell, cell death is normal. That's called aging. We know that as finding it harder to remember things and other issues. And some neural death can be accelerated. And that's what drugs and especially marijuana does. The earlier age of onset, the greater the damage. And what is the effect of that? Things like memory, IQ loss, and even some emotional issues as well. So what's the functional organization of the brain? So we have a better understanding of what areas in particular marijuana and drugs affect the brain. Well, this is your brain on Crayola crayons. And there are several different lobes to this. There is the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe. What we're going to really be focused on here is this frontal lobe. That frontal lobe is where some of the higher functions really happen, such as personality, emotion, judgment, and reasoning. There's also the motor strip. That's where coordination occurs. And then there's one deeper lobe called the limbic lobe. You can't see it here because it's deep, but I'm going to get to it. Now, this is the brain of an adult. As all of us know, the brains of children are organized much differently. This is the brain of, as you know, an adolescent. The love lobe is huge. The rebellion center is pretty, pretty big. Obviously, judgment gland is very small. All the answers is big. Memory for chores and homework, tiny, tiny. And then we've got all these other areas. Well, of course, I'm, I'm kidding around, but it seems like it's actually true. Haven't studied it. What about development of the brain? How does the brain develop? The brain develops from the back, in blue, to the front. So, the back is visual. That's one of the earliest things. Then we're moving forward. What we see here is the motor strip as we're moving up in age. And the last thing to develop is the frontal lobe, that area that's involved in judgment, reasoning. It's one of the last things to develop. They have done studies that say it's at the age of approximately 27 for boys and 26 for girls. Um, most parents know the reality is the frontal lobe develops somewhere in the 40s. Let's understand the direct effects of THC on different areas of the brain. The most direct area of the brain, and one you remember easily, is the hippocampus, this structure over here. The hippocampus is the area for memory, and that's where we understand the effects of marijuana on memory. Now let's look at another area of, of, very, um, important, of very high importance, the amygdala, very close to the hippocampus. The amygdala is the area that's involved with anxiety, fear, and anger. The reality is that THC attaching that area actually increases anxiety. They may be too stoned to know they're anxious, but it increases anxiety. And some people get paranoid. That would be the area where paranoia occurs. It's interesting here that the amygdala, where you get fear and high emotions, would be so close to the memory area of the hippocampus. Think about what do you remember? You remember things of high emotion. So let's go on a little bit here. Let's next look at another area of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is where appetite, hormones, and sexual behaviors occur. We know that people who use THC become hungry and their sexual behaviors increase. Now, connect that with the cortex, the frontal lobe of the cortex. We talked about that a little bit already. It's not developed to begin with. Now THC is affecting it even more. So what are the things that it affects? Judgment, making decisions. So here's a very bad combination. You have a person who has a hypothalamus that is interested in doing sexual behaviors, and then you remove the reasoning and judgment, and you have a perfect storm for somebody doing something that they may not want to at the time. 
Also, the frontal lobe interprets basic emotions, self-esteem, guilt, worthlessness, things like that. I want to talk about the ventral striatum for a minute. The ventral striatum is where we get reward, happiness, motivation. When the, when the THC affects this area, it floods it. And that's why kids gravitate to it. You see, kids are primed to learn. That's why when you see a kindergartner spell a word, their face lights up. When you see an eighth grader make a jump shot, they're excited. That's why when a person learns to drive in the 10th, 11th, 12th grade, they're really excited about that. They're primed to learn new things. The problem is when marijuana THC affects this area of the brain, that prime learning means that they want to get it again and again and again. So they want marijuana over and over and over again because it has so much more stimulation than other areas, than other things that they could be doing. And then the problem becomes, what happens when the marijuana is not enough? Then they can start looking for other things that are more stimulating, such as other drugs. The brain and the, uh, the excuse me, the brainstem and the spinal cord. This is areas where vomiting and pain sensation are, and that's why sometimes THC is used for people who have cancer and are being treated and have nausea. The basal ganglia and the cerebellum are where we have balance. And that's affected by marijuana. Again, THC affects all these areas. And these are the areas that are tested when a sobriety test occurs. These are all the things that can happen from marijuana. And, by the way, the reverse is true too. Someone who's using marijuana who stops can start to show these symptoms as well. Marijuana increases the risk of mental illness. In girls, you're at eight, five times increased risk of depression, boys four times. Suicide risk increases, at least for attempts. And your development of dependency can increase 18 times. And that's dependency for any type of drug using marijuana. So what is dependence? Dependence is need to use it. What's a need to use it feel like? That's a craving. And the way I like to explain cravings to students is the following. Let's say you're in the middle of a book. It's a great book. And all of a sudden, your mom calls you for dinner or your dad or whoever you're with calls you for dinner. Or let's say you're in the middle of that great video game and you're being called to dinner. You have to put it down. What do you think about all during dinner? You think about that video game. You think about that book. It means that the rest of your conversations, the interest level you have in your family or in your activities are, are way down. You just want to get back to that. Well, that's what a craving is, except for drugs, that craving occurs all the time, day and night. In people who have dependency issues, marijuana is used in 9% of those people. And first time they used it was in the teenage years. So marijuana and dependency are very much linked. So how many people have dependency? About 10% of the people have dependency. That's one in every 10 people are hooked on some drug, including marijuana. So how do you reduce your risk of becoming hooked? Well, the longer you stay drug free, the less likely you are to become addicted to a drug, any drug. For example, people who wait till they're 20 years old actually reduce their risk of becoming dependent to any drug. Normally it's, one, normally it's 10%. Their risk, if they just stay drug free until 20, goes down to two to 4%. Now, the opposite is true as well. If you use before the age of 20, your risk of developing a dependency issue goes up to as high as 25%. 
Now, this is a very interesting and frankly scary slide, and I'd like to take a minute or two to, to understand it. This slide has to do with a gene called the COMP-T gene. The COMP-T gene is involved with this neurotransmitter you might have heard of called dopamine, okay? In order for me to explain this simply and clearly, I'm going to just go ahead and remove that middle bar. There are two particular types of this gene. One is the MET variant, and one is the VAL variant. The MET variant, if you have that MET, MET variant, and you use marijuana, which is the green bar, before the, or during adolescence, or if you don't use marijuana during adolescence, your risk of developing psychosis, schizophrenia, is about the same as the general population. Now here's the interesting part. If you have this other variant called the Val Val variant, the green bar, if you use cannabis as an adolescent, your risk of developing psychosis and schizophrenia is almost two and a half times the risk if you had the Met Met variant. Here's another interesting point. If you don't use cannabis, before or during adolescence, there seems to be a protective factor of this Val-Val gene. This is, this is important, scary stuff. This is, we don't, we don't test for Met-Met and Val-Val. This is Russian roulette played with marijuana for schizophrenia. Question for you. True or false, marijuana is approved for medical use. The answer to that is false. It's really false. The FDA has not approved marijuana for any medical use. Some states have approved it for what they call medicinal use. And usually that's for cancer treatment patients, pain patients. Remember we talked about that? That's where the brainstem and spinal cord comes in. This brings us to the yeah butters. Yeah, but it's legal. It's medical. Well, no, it's not medical. And the reality is the FDA has not approved it. So while it may be legal in some states, in fact, it's not a FDA approved drug to be used. Here's another yeah, but. Which is worse? I get this all the time. Alcohol or marijuana? Alcohol or cocaine? It's marijuana, da, da, da. Let's take a look at this for a second. Here's cannabis. This is a harm graph. It takes into the account the blue, which is harm to the users, as well as harm to others. So it's not a simple toxicology screen. This is the damage, the complete damage it does. Motor vehicle accidents, social effects, financial effects. Cannabis is right here. Cannabis is more harmful than LSD, ecstasy, mushrooms. A lot of our kids don't know that. And sure, cannabis is less harmful in the overall scheme than alcohol or heroin, but that doesn't mean it's not harmful. So in this graph, cannabis has a 20 out of 100, alcohol has 70 out of 100. If I said to you or to the student, hey, I'm sending you on a plane ride if you want to go, the one plane crashes 70 times out of 100. The other one crashes 20 times out of 100. Which plane do you want to take? I think we all know no plane. The other analogy that I feel is very helpful for kids it, when they say, well, which is worse? I ask them, which do you want? Would you like a test, homework, or a day off. Neither of the two. The point is, it's a choice. It's a choice to use neither or nothing. This is THC, the psychoactive component of marijuana. But marijuana has over 400 compounds in it and over 2,000 metabolites. Marijuana affects health. It's all the things that are being listed right here. It's the things about your effects of tar, heart rate, 
actually blood pressure and for some people heart attack as well. Marijuana affects on motor function. We already talked about that, that it does affect motor function. And here's what happens when you're driving. Slower reaction time, motor coordination problems, poor judgment. You know, things like doing donuts. Marijuana is the second most common drug after alcohol found in the blood of drivers in car accidents. Mar uh, drivers with THC were twice as likely to be responsible for deadly crashes. Why use? Who's at risk? You need to think social, you need to think psychological, and you need to think biologic. Biologic, kids get addicted. Marijuana is addicting. You need to think socially. Friend groups, peer pressure. You need to think about parents using. Those things increase risk. You need to understand the psychological aspect as well. People use for things like depression and anxiety, self-medicating, even though it makes it worse. It's a maladaptive coping skill, and we need to give them better coping skills and better alternatives. Thank you for watching. Principlesforprinciples.org is a resource for all people, and I thank you for your time. Want something better than that? I was just thinking, like, <laughs> do you want to say, like, for more information, do you, do you have information on your website? Are there any questions for you? Like, do you want to send anyone towards you?